Excellent. Moving on, we will be moving on in our program to welcome Irene Yen from the University of California, San Francisco, to join us and speak to us about built environment, what it is, and how it influences the diets of older adults. just forward. Okay, all right. Thank you again for the invitation to come today. Um, it's been really great to hear the presentations that I've been able to catch, and I thought I would just start off with um, finding out who we are in the room for now. Um, I have seen a list of people, but I wanted to find out from you all directly, and also you can see for yourselves. I'm just curious if by raising a hand, if you can tell me if you're involved or working in the policy sector. Okay, and our uh, service providers, academic researchers, uh, nonprofits, and did I miss a category? Oh, well. <laughs> um, students. <laughs> I like to think we all are all the time, but uh, thank you. So, um, I appreciate knowing. Uh, so I got asked to speak on built environment, and uh, I pre feel like the prior speakers really helped set up what I want to talk about. Um, since you're hearing so many different presentations, I wanted to just introduce lang language terminology to you for the work that you might be doing in policy research practice or your studies. So if you're looking into reports or literature, you'll, you'll know what to look for or maybe what we mean when we use it from the research side. I'm trained as an epidemiologist, so uh, mostly in quantitative research, although I've done a lot of qualitative research recently, and I have a similar, I think, evolution as Joe reflected in his presentation in terms of looking at associations, that's what I was trained to do, and then feeling that looking at the numbers and seeing what's associated and what's not, it's not always clear what exactly is going on. And so when you start to talk to people, you find out more nuance, and that can really affect how we understand and interpret and then act on or carry out or disseminate the information. Um, so I'm hoping that this will provoke some thinking and, and uh, reactions from you all. So. Uh, I, I will talk about the built environment and more generally neighborhood and health research and look at some examples of how the built environment influences older adults' diet. Uh, mentioning very quickly about hunger and obesity, I, I feel like Craig really covered that extremely well and Joe as well in his remarks also and just talking about making food choices, Julie's presentation really set this up. And then um, some reflections on knowledge gaps and research priorities. And I think since this workshop is partly highlighting the needs of vulnerable older adults, and you've heard it a lot now already, there are very wide open spaces where we don't know things and as we know, lots of opportunities and needs coming going forward in our near term future where I think this information would be very useful and I, I'm sure you would all agree. Oh, I made the same mistake Craig has made. <laughs> I forgot these light up, apologies. Okay, so just to take a little bit of a step back, so I do research in neighborhood and health, or m more recently expanded into place and health, and I did a, a, not a librarian certified PubMed search from 1954 to 2014, so the health and medical public health research to look for neighborhood environment in the studies. So I just wanted to show you all that this is a field that's been expanding very rapidly in the last um, 60 years. <coughs> If you compare this, by the way, to genetic research, it pales in comparison. But just so you know that this has really increased very rapidly, and I think, I think a lot of this most recently has been around um, obesity questions. So in this neighborhood environment research in the public health world, um, we think about it in terms of built environment, um, sometimes also called the physical environment. And this usually refers to physical attributes of our surroundings, so structural conditions, uh, walkability, recreation, so crosswalks, speed limits, open spaces, parks, play areas, and then availability of health-promoting resources, grocery stores, fast food places, um, actually those are the not health-promoting, but so grocery stores, playgrounds, um, small food markets, and, um, the other kinds of positive health-promoting resources, and then also undesirable amenities, and this would where we would probably put the fast food places and the liquor stores. So this is how these get measured in these areas of research, or thought about, I should say. So f for a specific example related to place and food or diet, uh, I think uh, Julie, Craig, and Joe, I think all mentioned access, availability to having 
food stores. And there's a phrase that's been introduced by the USDA called the food desert, which maybe some of you have already heard about. Um, the uh, census and the USDA both make available data around where food stores are by census tract. And if, if it's a census tract that's classified as low income where there are a large number of residents that are more than a mile from a grocery store, that's referred to as a food desert. So this is a screenshot of the USDA food desert locator map. You can go on there and put your address in there or anybody else's address and see if it comes up in a food desert. And the concept, of course, behind this is that if you live somewhere where you're more than a mile away from a grocery store, you have less access to the foods that are for sale there. Now, I think, I've forgotten which one it was, but one of the speakers also mentioned just having the store there doesn't completely equate with access. And I see some nodding heads, and you can imagine that getting there is, is an issue. Mobility will come up, has come up. Also, transportation. Uh, in a lot of parts of the U.S., there aren't any sidewalks. So even if it's close by or you have the physical capacity to get there on foot, it may not be safe to get there. So this is a representation. It's certainly important that these data are available, and it's a concept that I wanted you to know about. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight some of the research that's been done. I don't necessarily want you to be able to read this, but I wanted you to know an example of one of those many articles, especially in recent years, that have been looking at neighborhood and food-related, in this case, body mass index. I will say um, many, most of these articles do not, in fact, focus specifically on older adults, which is one of the research needs and uh, opportunities that we're presented with. But uh, Mei Wong, who's a nutrition epidemiologist um, in Southern California now, uh, published this study, and it's from the Stanford Heart Disease Prevention Program data, and she's looking at, or their team was looking at, the neighborhood density of small grocery stores and how it was associated with higher BMI among women, and that closer proximity to chain supermarkets was associated with higher BMI. So again, looking at this idea of proximity to these stores. So another concept that, that's in neighborhood research uh, in addition to the built environment is the social environment. And I wanted to highlight it here today because I think that, uh, in fact, they're closely connected to each other, they influence each other, and I think it should be uh, something that we're all aware of. So what do we mean by social environment? So most commonly, much of the neighborhood research has looked at the socioeconomic composition of the residents in a neighborhood, some kind of administrative unit, oftentimes the census tract. So in particular, the proportion of the people living in that area who um, might have poverty level incomes, as an example. Uh, social aspects of neighborhoods can also be ascertained with other data, such as crime. Um, statistics, and then there are survey-based data, community support, collective efficacy, sometimes also um, included in with the concept of social capital or social cohesion. So this idea of being uh, uh, familiar with your neighbors, helping each other out, acting as, a, as an entity. So keeping a lookout for things going on in the neighborhood. Um, if you see something going on that doesn't look like something you normally see happening in your neighborhood, do you call the police? Do the police come? Do you feel like your neighborhood works together in that way, kind of looking out for each other? And then social capital, or I should go back, I'm sorry, to the collective efficacy. That's around the efficacy. Social cohesion, um, well, I, I sh these concepts get kind of muddied, I will say. So there's the, the classic concept of do you borrow a cup of sugar or do you know a neighbor who you could borrow a cup of sugar from, which is really old fashioned and I've talked about it with my students in the past. And um, for example, in San Francisco, they find this to be a really outdated idea because there are so many um, shops all around San Francisco and if you ran out of sugar and were making something, there's actually usually a place that's open at night that you can get to within blocks. So they feel like that's just not relevant, but um, I, I'm not really sure what the current version of when you run out of sugar is. Uh, maybe some of you have an idea. Anyway, so, so, so social capital, um, this idea that you have um, uh, a sense within your neighborhood that you share a collective value that you gain from you know, walking around, walking your dog around, and interacting maybe informally, briefly with the different people on your block. And then another aspect of social environment is social disorder, which can be reflected in um, the appearance of the place uh, when you see trash or graffiti or um, 
uh, sometimes they talk about people standing around um, in different corners and things like that, and uh, maybe um, related to other infrastructure or lack thereof, so lighting, um, and even possibly related to reports of crime or sense of feeling not safe. Okay, so I, I mentioned this uh, when I brought up the concept of social environment, but certainly built environment and social environment are very, um, they uh, influence each other, they affect each other. They I think it's hard to think about them separately or you wanna be aware of how they interact with each other. And so one example of this is um, an, a study um, done in, uh, in the early 2000s, um, the authors found that respondents living in walkable neighbors were more likely to know their neighbors, participate politically, trust others, and be socially engaged. So this idea that if the neighborhood is conducive to walking, you might then walk in it, and then you will be out and about, and you will be talking to your neighbors. A concept that has been um, looked at related to older adults specifically it was brought up by, I believe it's um, Scott Brown, who's in Florida, who's looked at Little Havana in uh, the Miami area, and he has um, the concept of eyes on the street. So um, in the Little Havana neighborhood, there's front porches, and people will sit on them, and they, that's, they socialize when people walk by, but also they're out and about, and they're looking, and they're keeping an, uh, effectively keeping an eye on things. Um, I'm gonna bring this relationship up between these two as I bring up some specific concepts related to social environment in a, a minute or so. So um, remember I said that social environment's oftentimes measured by the composition of the area and I talked about income and poverty. Uh, another way that social environment can be measured is by looking at uh, segregation measures. So index, indices of dissimilarity uh, or um, ethnic enclave measures or uh, other ways to measure segregation. So this is a map that I believe it comes from a government entity, and I'm sorry I don't remember the source, but if you type residential segregation into Google, one of this map will come up in your, in your top searches. And it's from the 2010 census, and it shows a uh, proportion of blacks in census block groups all across the country, and the very dark red areas have zero, and as it gets, uh, pinker, if you will, lighter shades of red, the proportions will increase. So you have, um, I would say, a pretty clear visual sense of um, where there are higher proportions and lower proportions of black residents in the United States. And maybe you've been hearing um, recently about how with um, a lot of the, the violence and police violence going on and Black Lives Matter that um, there's more public media and public conversation about um, are the segregation levels in the United States. And I would say that we could draw connections between um, the socioeconomic, ethnic composition of areas and investments of public and private dollars for infrastructure and services and amenities and stores and that sort of thing. And so bringing back to this idea of how social environment and built environment can be connected or related to each other. And in fact, there is research that's looked at ethnic segregation and economic segregation and looking at biomarkers of diet in New York City adults by uh, Professor Yi and her colleagues. And they found that um, there was an association between living in segregated and higher poverty areas and something um, called the, um, uh, something she looked at was potassium in intake, which she says is a marker of fruit and vegetable consumption. And I'm not an RD or nutrition person, so I'm hoping that you all um, understand this point, but she said that, found in her data that potassium intake was lower in the high versus low Hispanic segregated neighborhoods. Um, the study that she published is of a general adult population, but I wrote to her um, and asked her if she could do a sub-analysis for just the people who are over 45 or in the older age groups to be able to bring that to you today, and she kindly did that for me. So for 45 and older, she found a consistent finding is what she reported in her paper. Um, and then the sodium potassium ratio was higher in the high versus low Hispanic segregated neighbors, neighborhoods as well, as well as in the high versus low poverty neighborhoods. So this is one of the few um, analyses that I was able to find that specifically looked at an older adult population and also looked specifically at segregation and its association with diet or dietary um, mar marker. 
So um, this is a little bit busy, I apologize, but I wanted to say that along the lines of how we are residentially segregated, we're also segregated by economics. And, and uh, again, in the public conversation, we've been hearing about um, rising inequalities. Um, if I can. So this, this shows um, the proportion of families living in high, middle, and low income neighborhoods in metropolitan areas from 1970 to uh, 2009, and so really what you're looking at is that the bottom chunks and the top chunks, as time goes on, get bigger, get larger, and what this means is that there is a widening income inequality and that there, um, the affluent neighborhoods, which are the top portions, there's more people living in those as time goes on, and these are the lower income areas, and there's more people proportionally living those between 1970 and 2009. So this idea that there's this kind of less than sign, if you will, uh, tr pattern showing over these decades of the widening income distribution in our neighborhoods. Okay, so um, this is all about diet and older people, and you already have heard, um, seen very good statistics, but I just wanted to pause here and just talk about, so I've sh talked about the concepts of built environment and social environment, try to give you examples of what are measured or looked at when we do those kind of um, studies, and also talked about how uh, things have changed over time with um, built environment, or I'm sorry, with social environment, you could certainly look at changes over time with built environment. What that could mean uh, numbers of stores, locations of stores, and um, if we wanted to extend to something like walkability, which could provide access to these places, you can also look at changes in that. And so now I just wanted to mention, you know, why do we care about this for older people? Of course, we are all aware that hunger in older people is a, is a serious problem and that it's been on the increase. I won't belabor that point. Um, I'm stuck. Oh, here we go. And uh, also other speakers have very well made the point that um, we have a situation with older adults and obesity. Um, this is data from National Health and Nutrition Survey showing um, with different age groups, older age groups, how, um, and these are the men and these are the women, and from different years we have an increased proportion of older people who are obese. And uh, you all probably know better than I do about how hunger and obesity um, can go together, that you can be hungry and obese, and that this could be a combination, um, even a bigger problem, bigger, uh, a more serious situation to address from a health and wellness point of view. And I don't think I need to make the point for you all that diet is associated with obesity. I actually didn't find very much specific research that focuses on the connection between these two for older adults, which I found quite interesting. Um, this was one example of something I found that looked at diet soda, diet soda intake in older adults, and the more diet soda intake going across here, the um, increase in um, change in weight circumference. So this was a... Um, longitudinal study tracking diet soda intake over time, and they were showing that as they consumed more, their waists got bigger um, in centimeters. And, and so I kind of alluded to some research gaps, but I'll just take the last couple of minutes to talk a little about it, and I, I think I just wanted to highlight the vulnerable populations uh, point that is part of the overall theme of today. And again, this has also been mentioned before, but I guess want to highlight it uh, a couple points. So. Um, I think it was Beth who talked about feeding people and having they being um, sick. So we already know as a country that uh, as people get older, they get more chronic conditions. This is and also the older you are, the more chronic conditions you have. I guess I said that already. So this is by age, 80% of people over 65 have what's termed multiple chronic conditions. <laughs> The most common ones, not surprising, I'm sure to y'all. So this is just for this is not broken down by age, but we would probably know if you're in service or policy, or research or students that um, you know hypertension, high cholesterol, are very common in older people. Um, diabetes is listed here. These are conditions that are very much affected by diet. It's extremely important to manage your conditions um, with diet and. Primary providers know this. They're always talking to their patients about their diet, and it's a very 
difficult uh, for patients who are at risk, hungry, living in isolated places, living on their own without family support, have uh, limited incomes to be able to achieve the dietary recommendations that their providers are giving them. So, um, but we don't know very much about this. And, and this idea that you're making choices and you're not really having an opportunity to think consciously about them and you're responding to cues, I think all of these areas are areas that we actually need to understand better. So I just wanted to, um, I'm going to skip through this because I'm running out of time, and just highlight a quote. So I've been working for the last three years at a safety net county hospital, and we did do a, a photo voice project with African American men with heart failure. Um, and these are men who are in their 40s and 50s who have heart failure and a number of other conditions. They all had multiple chronic conditions. They were quite sick. And food was a huge thing for them. They didn't know what to buy necessarily or how to prepare it, and then the social aspects came up. So this is just a quote for you to, uh, uh, I was going to say chew on, I apologize. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the gentleman said, tired of chicken, oh God, I am tired of chicken. Food is boring. I try to stay healthy, try to cook everything, try to stay away from fast foods, but it is, it doesn't work all the time. Fast food restaurant, everybody wants to go. Hey, let's stop here, Jack in the Box, Burger King. So it's not fun. This was his exclamation about frustration about dealing with what he had to deal with and being so sick. So um, looking forward to the Q&A, and thank you very much. <laughs>